few boxes, you know, in the heat in the Midwest. It's like 90 degrees with humidity. But I, I realized that there was this thing called the art department where the books were, I, you know, I didn't really know, but I thought they're doing illustrations and they're designing book covers back there. And I was an introvert, like super shy, so, but somehow I got the um, audacity to approach some of the folks that worked inside, away from the warehouse, to see if I could actually split time in that art department. So at the time I was 16, I was working in there, and I was actually doing actual illustrations that would show up in the books, and, you know, pre-computers, so you're having to lay out at all the pages of these books. So I've been involved in the books since I was in high school. So maybe long story short, um, so I had an idea that you could actually make a living doing what you love, uh, luckily at a very early age. So, um, Well, you say your parents really invested and encouraged. What did that look like? Well, I, if I just kind of visualize my bedroom that I shared with my two brothers, right? So you got three boys, um, various ages, uh, in a very tight quarters. So you've got three beds. But the three other elements in this room were a drafting table that they got me, right? So I could do the drawing. Uh, a sand-filled weightlifting set, because of course the three boys, they need to lift weights, right? right. They want to look good. Um, but what the, the big unlock is they, and again, this, 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 there wasn't a lot here, it's you've got a family of um, seven on a teacher's salary, right? Yeah. So public teacher, so that's, that's so they, my father took um, a wall, uh, unfinished wall in the bedroom, and put a wood frame around it, so it looked like a giant, painting, right? And he said, this is your mural. You get to draw whatever you want. So I was like, well, this is great. And so um, I began to draw um, sports logos constantly all over this wall, as well as superheroes, because I was obsessed with <laughs> comic books, right? Another way to escape from reality is, is superheroes. I just had no idea I'd grow up and be working with real life superheroes. Right. The tight quarters in that bedroom, no. but uh, we, we did the best we could. Seven kids, yeah. Always or five kids, oh, okay. yeah. but still. Seven people. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So you graduated in '92. That was kind of a big summer for you. What happened? What were you yeah, doing? Yeah, you know, I uh, need to back up a year. Um, I had the uh, Michael Jordan's famous Wings poster in my. Uh, apartment uh, in college, right? So every day I came home and this poster had a quote uh, by William Blake that said, no bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. And so Michael's arms are outstretched like this, black and white photo, and he's just staring at you. So I saw that every day, but I had no idea a year later I would be working for the person that designed it at this place in Portland, Oregon called Nike. Um, so, um, so yeah, every day seeing that just as a reminder of like, you know, dream big, right? And commit to that dream and may turn out to, to be reality someday. Um, but, uh, so long story short, um, I find out that there's Nike's launching its first internship in their history, right? 18 spots and, um, and, uh, I ended up applying for it. Again, this is back like the Pony Express, right? You're, you're sending stuff in the mail and hoping they get it. <laughs> this is my portfolio, and I'd like to get it back. Uh, but uh, yeah, I end up getting the and, and you know when I got it, it's just a sheet of paper that says you've gotten an internship at Nike. Just make sure you're here on like June, I think it was June sixth, and there was an address. That's it. Uh, and I I had I didn't have so it was no money, but Back then, you could, you could get a credit card that had cash on it, and so that's that's how I funded my trip out there, to, you know, to have some money. But my parents borrowed me their their van, um, and I was a little bit embarrassed about it at first because it had, you know, the airbrush on the side, it had a ladder on the back, and the, 
you know, poker tables and blinds and stuff. Um, but actually, it turned out to be a huge advantage because people at the office thought it was the greatest thing of all time. So I had to drive everybody everywhere that first summer, but that's how I got to, you know, gladly, right? Because right. that was my way of introducing myself. And so I thank them and that band yeah. like every day for right. kickstarting that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so showing up to this place in Beaverton, Oregon, the campus had just opened um, in 1992 that, yeah, that summer. So it, the energy was just crazy. And you can imagine for me um, walking on campus for the first time and there's buildings called Michael Jordan Building and the Bo Jackson Fitness Center. So I, I was just, but yeah, so I, I did, I, what I talk about in the book is, is I didn't know anyone and I didn't, everyone wanted first and last month's rent. So I just slept in the van until that Monday when work started. So I could just figure like, how, how am I gonna do this? Like, you know, I can't find a place to live. So I'm just living in the van in the parking lot. People are like, is that, oh, that's your van. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, Suzuki violin. My son is a Suzuki, Suzuki, not me, but they had all the, the you know, the bumper stickers. <laughs> I couldn't get them off, so. Because I'm into the, you know, design. Things yeah. gotta look a certain way. Right. Yeah. It just kind of didn't fit my brand, I thought. So. That's funny. Um, so you did your internship. You went back to Minneapolis for a time. And then... Yeah, I went back because I... The Nike internship was just supposed to be a pit stop, right? right. Come out three months and then go back to the big one, which was the Walker Art Center, which is a museum of modern art mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. Is at the you know just like uh, the, the top of the heap as far as um, modern art museums in the world. Each year they had two coveted spots for their internship program, but they were a year. So yeah, I I, I got one of those, but um, by the eighth month. Um, Eighth month, uh, someone from Nike called and said, "Hey, we have this position, but you know, you it's, you have to come down. You would have to leave here, and um, you, you just can't. It'd be like getting an internship at Goldman Sachs and telling them like halfway through you're you're good and you're just going to leave. You, you can't do that, right? But I got again, kind of like the the publishing company I talked about. Somehow, again, you have to understand, I was I had not found my voice yet. I'm just being but somehow I went into my boss's office, who was uh, Lori Haycock Macla, one yeah. of the premier yeah. creative leaders in the world at the time. Um, and uh, I was like, you know, I, I want to go back to Nike because what I've discovered, you know, is um, the, your ability to reach and inspire people all over the world, of all types of people, you know, um, it, it was just too appealing. Got a taste of that that summer of 1992, where you had the Barcelona Olympics, you had the Blazers playing uh, Michael Jordan in the playoffs, Agassi at Wimbledon. It was just like a phenomenal summer of sport. So um, I just yeah. So I I drove. Uh, I made. I actually made that drive back in a slightly better car. Um, <laughs> and because uh, Nike, I don't know if they were too cheap, but they're like, yeah, why don't you just drive back here? I was like, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, had a you know had a few more dollars um, to show up with, which was good. Um, so it wasn't such a struggle. Good. Um, yeah. But. We're gonna talk some about your career there, but you spent 27 years at Nike at a time when that just doesn't happen anymore. Nobody, yeah. nobody stays long enough to get the gold watch. It's true. Yeah, or telescope or. Whatever, whatever, it is. whatever it is. Yeah. Like I'm how sure, or why? I, yeah, I'm sure we'll find out how yeah. and why they kept you. Cause well, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we didn't have a choice. So. But, it, but it's kind of a remarkable thing. Yeah, well, I, it's, I tell people it's kind of like, imagine because you're, you're, you're ramping up to a Summer Olympics or a World Cup of Soccer every two years. So imagine, and the landscape of technology is changing and consumers' expectations are growing and, and you're launching new and 
renovations every two years. So it really, truly felt like it was a series of two-year graduate schools that, like, you know, you got done with the Summer Olympics in Atlanta in 96, and now you're gearing up for the World Cup in 98 in Paris. So I never felt, because uh, I, I, I always say this, complacency is the enemy of creativity. Once you stop growing and wanting to learn, it's like, um, start to regress you know, on your ability to, to dream and imagine new, new things. So I never felt that because um, it always felt like you're doing these stair steps. And, um, and of course, the brand is growing too. I, when I entered it, it was $3 billion. And of course, this year, you know, it's hitting around $50 billion. So, uh, so that, that explains it. And you know, maybe not totally sane. I don't know, um, but, uh, but it seems to have worked out. So. Okay. so your book is called The Motion by Design. What does that mean? Yeah, so it's the, the well, it's not just, and I want to be clear, because it's not just about brand building, I think, just in general. I think I believe that everyone has creative capacity, right? You don't have to be able to draw. You don't have to have, have the word, word design in your title. And emotion by design is intentionally, intentionally unleashing the creative that you have within you um, through different practices and disciplines that ultimately uh, the outcome is strong emotional connections with people, places, and communities. And if you think about, um, you know, just look at this cover for a second. That the, the abstraction of those shoes is actually the, the Air Force One, right? And the Air Force One was designed um, in 1982, and yet here we are in 2022, and it is the biggest selling sneaker in the world. And that's only part of it, it's also the most influential sneaker in culture still, 40 years later. And that's because that the teams that have worked on that over the year have intentionally infused and surrounded this particular product with stories and experiences that stir people's emotions, that, um, that you know, um, instill this self-belief and confidence in people to achieve great things. That's emotion by design. And so, and I always say this, you know, average or good brands spend the majority of the time asking the question how they want their audience to feel about their brand. And that's part of branding, right? Create an impression in your audience's mind so they feel a certain way about you. The absolute pinnacle brands ask a different question. How do you want people to feel about themselves when they interact with you and their ability to achieve their potential? That's it. Those are transcendent brands, right? And so I wanted to share that philosophy of, of the filters and the questions you can ask in your own life um, to to inspire people to have a stronger connection with them. And at the end of the day, emotion is what inspires emotion, is what connects people together, right? And if I could say one last thing, because it is a call to arms of it, because I do feel relationships are becoming more automated today, right? Not just brands and consumers, but people, um, because of the amount of time we spend on our phone, because of the emphasis on data and analytics and machine learning to drive it, which there's a lot of good with that, right? Because um, it's given us all more convenience. Um, but a lot of the art and the um, imagination that is responsible for the emotional connections has been a bit squeezed out of the process. So I had a bit of urgency um, in, in, in something that I, I wanted to get out there. It's been um, resonating the way it is. And then you, you've touched on a lot of this, but one of the major themes that comes across in your book is empathy. Yeah. And how that. Tell me, talk to us a little bit about how you create that within your own culture, but also how that. how you connect your, to your audience. Yeah, you, that's, 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 that's great. Right. Yeah, empathy. Well, I mean, let's start first with just the the creative problem solving process, right? Whether you're telling a story, uh, whether you're creating a 
product or building a store like this. Um, if you're creating a store, you, you, you can't start creating until you define the insight or the truth that you want to reveal to the world. And empathy is what um, is the act of peeling back the layers and trying to learn about your subject and whatever that experience is. And you want to pull that out and then reveal that in a profound way. So that's empathy within the process of innovations and whether it's, pro you know. So I'll give you an example because it's, it's and you're going to say, well, I'm gonna, we're going to go take the time machine back again, but you're going to say, well, how does empathy connect with Michael Jordan? He's the best you know, basketball player in the world, arguably. But one of the most, my favorite commercial of all time that I wasn't involved with was the Michael Jordan failure spot from 1997 because a team took the time to have a conversation with Michael as he's going for his sixth NBA championship. And he reveals that he's missed... 9,000 shots. He's um, lost 300 games, and 26 times he's been asked to take the game when he's shot, he's missed. And he's like, because I've failed over and over again, that's why I succeed. So you can imagine everyone else is telling a story of greatness through the lens of athleticism. And all of a sudden, here comes this other story that we can all relate to because we can't take off from the free throw line and dunk the basketball. <laughs> But we all can relate to this idea of putting yourself in position to take the shot. But sometimes we need to be inspired to see people that are successful that also miss. So that's in the sense of how can you as a team or an individual take the time to listen um, and um, really understand people's lived experiences, just like you're, you're, if you're a business owner the people you serve, your consumers, so you can serve them better. And then with your team, of course, um, you know, we're in a moment of, in time where um, you, you have to have uh, great uh, empathy and sensitivity to just everything you've experienced in the world, continue to experience with these extreme events. Um, and um, under, understanding that the world you live isn't necessarily that the world someone else is, is living. And I think coaching, when I was brought up, everybody was coached the same. Like, you know, talking in sports, and, but also, you know, even in business. Um, one size fits all. Um, that's not very empathetic. Um, and uh, there's this, I'm going, I'm gonna go on a tangent, but just, and what you'll learn about me is I'm, I, I like sports analogies. So you're just gonna have to bear with me because I never apologize for it. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Phil Jackson had something. He, Phil Jackson, uh, one of the winningest coaches of all time, multiple championships with the Lakers and the Bulls, had a system. He called it the magic ratio. And it was the number of positives to negatives that in terms of when he was coaching a particular player. So instead of coaching everybody the same, he coached, you know, he, he would give three positives to one negative to Shaq. Shaq, you're not shooting your free throws well, but doing these three different things because he's trying to create momentum and a relationship and trust um, and confidence while also working on those. And my point is why I use that is empathy means that you're, you have a, you're trying to deeply understand each individual uh, and recognizing them for who they are, where they are at the moment. And when you do that, I think it's, it's the productivity. It's good for business. Um, it's good for team morale, but um, it, um, it's it's something I think is is woven throughout this. Obviously, I, I spend a lot of time on Nike social impact issues. Um, I talk about the Colin Kaepernick campaign um, in the book, and a lot of those were full. You know, my uh, mission uh, to to bring help with teams bring a lot of that. Uh, into the world was was forged out of my own upbringing, right? And feeling like an outsider. And when you're an outsider, you tend to look at other outsiders. You know, you tend to protect other outsiders, right? Yeah. So I just happened to work at a brand where I was allowed to show up and 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 bring those experiences and perspectives actually into the workplace. When quite frankly, uh, at you know many brands at that time, that, that just didn't happen. 
but um, this this was this was a good number. Right. Throughout throughout the book and, and your stories in the book, which are phenomenal, by the way, we'll, we'll, you've told some, and we'll hit on a few others. But Nike really seemed to provide a culture of freedom and experimentation and innovation. And you guys, it seems like you guys just had a lot of latitude to just try. That's right. And see what happened. And yeah, I, well, it's funny. I, I go all the way back to my orientation for my internship, and there was kind of two statements that um, I got that day. Um, and Jeff Hollister was the, yeah, the, the third employee at Nike, right? And he's the person talking to us as 22 year old interns, and he's talking about, you know, how Steve Prefontaine said, you know, to not give your best is to essentially waste the gift you've been given. And, and they talked about this, this mantra of leading from the front. And so from the very first time you go through the door, um, you learn that, you know, we're not going to play to lose. Like, we're going to lead from, from the front, right? And that means go out fast. And so why I say that is, is you're standing on the shoulders of, like, all this... Um, you know, uh, equity built into the traits of courage and risk taking. Um, so, when you're in an environment like that, and you feel the uh, responsibility and and the support, and so um, you literally, you, you, and here's the thing: it's one thing to get the space to create and dream about things that you know don't exist or or. or people don't believe are possible, but to then get the platform to share those uh, ideas as well as get them funded, and I share, share quite a few of them because most often a lot of the, um, a lot of the best results came from just a couple people having a conversation. And oftentimes the conversation started with the question of what if, or why not. And, um, and that's why I say, I mean, the, the worst thing a, a, a company can do is create a culture where people have to ask for permission to use their imagination. Like, that's, that'd be a tough go. Um, yes, it's a business. Yes, you're there to provide business growth, or if it's a public company, shareholder value. But I do believe you still, you know, the, 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 the leading innovation brands um, create and protect the space to daydream. Um, and they, they uh, incentivize risk taking. And, um, and I think we can all, in our own lives, um, you know, back to getting outside our comfort zones, it's not getting complacent. Um, many of us moved to them. We, some of us didn't even know what we we're gonna do when we got here. Um, I hear that all the time. People just show up to Ben. I love that. Like, that, what a risk, right? Um, but, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, if you have the means to, right? Um, it's been a hell of a two years. Um, that's why I think um, coming, coming, we're not out of it, but um, we, we've lost a lot of space to dream in, in the last two years because from a business standpoint, you're optimizing what you have. Quickly, and from a personal standpoint, a lot of the people are just trying to get through it, right? Um, so, but um, so yeah, I, I think um, you know, in the chapter "Never Play It Safe, Play to Win," it's just outlining outlining what happens when you you develop a culture um, that is that that really accepts failure. This idea of failure leading to success. Not failure equals failure, and thou shall never take another risk again. Right. So I look at I like to look at brands to say if something didn't work out, do does, does the team still get the opportunity to come back and present new ideas in the future, or is, is, is that? Yeah. Yeah. You tell one story in particular that I that I really liked, to play with and how that just where that led 
Yeah, I mean, that would just give you an example of what I mean by just a, a culture of, of where, where you, you are allowed to, you know, dream and space to do it and then be able to um, test and learn and put things out in the world. And Mark, my friend Mark Smith was just, he, he was fascinated with tattoos and he started um, experimenting with a laser machine on leather, not shoes, but just pieces of leather and doing different designs and patterns. Um, and, um, and then he gradually started to do that on uh, um, shoes and shoe leather and creating these intricate, almost tattooed patterns, right? Um, and, um, and I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of fast track and just to say that from his simple experimentation that shoe goes on to, th that shoe concept becomes a business. The shoes become a featured player on the show Entourage. The, sh the, the technique ultimately becomes the surface of the Jordan 20 sneaker. And then ultimately, Barack Obama is presented with one of the um, uh, lasered sneakers this, I think it was 2015. My point is, in the chapter, Don't Chase Cool, it's like that wasn't chasing cool or trying to be cool or be part of culture. It became part of culture because of passion and experimentation and purpose. And that's cool, right? Not chasing the latest influencer or social media platform or whatever it is. Um, you create an icon um, by through authenticity, right? And so when you think of things like the Levi's 501, right? We all probably have a something we hold up as a as an icon, the Air Force One, um, and and um, but these 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 all start, um, you know, through through passion and purpose. Meaning, they're in the case of like, um, you know, the Air Force One, it was created to. Um, solve the needs of a basketball player. And the time spent on creating an outsole where it was easy, easier for basketball players to pivot, like literally, you know, back in 1982. And guess what? Moses Malone the next year wins a championship with the Philadelphia 76ers. And again, I'm dating myself. And I wasn't even old enough really to understand that, by the way. So just so <laughs> But my point is, is it's it's like I think today, um, you, you know, there's no shortcuts to creating something that is that deeply embedded with that much influence and culture, you know. So it's just it's just really making sure that yes, part of our jobs, if you're in, in an, I don't care if it's a bookstore, it's a florist, or whatever it is, you have to be up to speed with the spirit of the times and the cultural currents of the day and the trends and what's going on. But you always have to balance that with who you are, what you believe, what's your mission and vision, and your values. And if you lose that, or you're unclear, um, you know, I think that's where you can come across as, as out of touch, or tone deaf, or trailing the play. One of the things you talk about is curiosity. Because, and I always say it's like empathy starts the process, and then curiosity is the the, you know, the rocket fuel. Um, because once you figure out what the problem is you're trying to solve, and or what the truth you want to reveal through your story, now you need points of inspiration in terms of how you're going to express it to the world. So it's really, you know, thankfully here in Bend, I mean, you have nature is the biggest source of inspiration. Truly, nature has inspired some of the greatest um, athletic footwear right, directly um, on that, just as car design has directly influenced um, shoe design. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we, I call it outside in, right? You're, you're, you know, get outside yourself first. You, you must, it's, it's back to don't get complacent. And we're not all naturally curious, right? But, but I do think you can train yourself to be more curious um, and find inspiration in different places.
this is you can give yourself a plan and homework to go out and meet people and see things. Um, and I always, I, I mean, I'm not totally proud of it, but I have like 86,000 photos on my iPhone. <laughs> and 5,000 of those photos are screenshots of quotes of, here's a piece of architecture I like, or you know, whatever it is. And, and, I, and I create folders. And all it takes is one of those to, to spark something and become something bigger. And I, I worked with uh, an athlete who took it to a different level and really showed people what it meant to lead a life of curiosity, and that was Kobe Bryant. And Kobe was what you'd call a lifelong learner because outside of basketball, all he was, he was just seeking the, the, all of the latest and newest things, whether it was technology, whether it was entertainment, um, and uh, whether it was the animal kingdom, of course, right? And so every time we met with him, he was equally generous in terms of sharing all these points of inspiration. You can imagine how uh, incredible it is for a creative partner. You know, he came in one day. He, he was he had um, was very interested in this um, this painter called Octavio Pambo, who who created these um, like picture within a picture. So like Salvador Dali, you'd see someone's face, but when you got closer, it was an entire city scene. He's like, well, I, I see myself the way I play like that. Like, um, you know, for one opponent may see me this way, but another might see me this way. And so we directly translated that into a campaign called the same animal, the different beast, right? And where we showcase these, these different animals made up of his actual sneaker, right? And so I'm just sharing that story of, of how how important it is to be curious, to look outside yourself, and then equally to share that with others, right? In hopes that, you know, maybe it sparks something um, in you that leads to the next, you know, billion dollar idea. <laughs> I'm still looking for that. But. <laughs> but you took your you took your team on some cool field trips, yeah, well. like to meet chefs and yeah. Seville, Seville World Road. Yeah, we, um, well, actually, like that's a very good example just for, for everybody. It's like I, I took the team, Savile Row in London, it's like the finest suit makers in the world, right? And some of the people that have worked in there have been there for, you know, decades, right? I mean, and uh, so took the team in there and, and we spent some time and looked at this incredible crafts, craft of service, right? And personalization. Um, and um, Lance, is that a saddle row? No, I, so, I, I was wondering if you were going to that. No, I got you. <laughs> um, that respect. Yeah, that respect. so so we we walked out, and as I, I and as I said, so many of these these big ideas of scale start with the question of what if, and we ask the question of, well, what if we took the saddle row model, at, and and created um, a a know the ability to customize your sneakers in a studio with with someone like one of these uh, you know incredible craftspeople and ultimately it started with one studio and that grew to a studio in every single flagship around the world in less than two years all because we we, we not only walked in um, with with a plan but came out with the confidence that we could kind of ask that question and then literally visualize that, bring it to life, and then show show the company what might be possible um, on that. And, and that's just you know, an example. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lot of fun. So. Yeah, yeah, well I didn't buy a, I didn't yeah, they didn't give me a suit, so uh, okay. well I'll, I'll go back and okay. see. How does diversity play into your into your experience and um, team building and productivity and all of that? Yeah, well, I, I always say diversity is the oxygen that breathes life into innovation, right? It's it's diverse. It's not just diversity isn't just about experience uh, expertise, right? It's about life experiences and perspectives. Um, and bringing people together and, and you know, having the 
those inter intersections happen is what opens up all those opportunities. And you know, certainly diverse rep diverse representation is is actually only being represented if it's activated. Like having a diverse team by the numbers is is just the first step. The point is is that people can draw on um, their their experiences and perspectives, oftentimes being the only person in the room for long stretches of their life. And bringing that in is creates what I call a vision advantage because isn't it amazing? Like think of um, the limited opportunity you might have if everybody's kind of come from the same place or had the same experience. Your aperture about what's out there and what you could bring to the world might be a little narrow, right? And so what diversity does and why it's so good for business and brand um, is, is you, you open up your peripheral vision and you see, you not only see places to grow your business, but you're also able to see people that don't have access to your inspiration and innovation because they have barriers, because they haven't felt that they were invited, right? Um, and there's there's so much, I'm just gonna give you an example, you know, there's lots of communities that felt they were never figuratively invited into the, the amazing outdoor uh, outdoors um, activities that we all take for granted, right? Uh, we live within it, um, but, um, there are communities that are underrepresented in all these amazing, uh, um, um, you know, things that, that that we do out here. And so you want teams to be aware of that and see that and and create that invitation and and on that. So that that that's one. And then of course, the second is um, when you 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 will feel more compelled as a brand to to. Um, maybe um, go beyond your business and, and um, take a stand on some of the most pressing issues in the world um, through your platform, right? My group is always sports. Um, but, you know, finding a way to connect what you sell with what the world needs at a given time. Um, and, um, and oftentimes we address things like racial injustice or climate change or whatever whatever it might be, but we we reveal the truth about um, that through through sports because that was our lens. And that's that's a big learning for any company that's looking to kind of change change the world just a little bit is you have to make sure that people can understand the connection to you and who you are. Because if they can't it gets somewhat confusing and can distract from what your business is, if you will, on that. So, so yeah, my role, so for me, coming into the, the room, you know, in 2017, when Colin didn't have a, a team to play for, Colin Kaepernick, you know, you have to understand that I'm in the room as the chief marketing officer, and like Colin, I'm half black, I'm half white, and like Colin, I'm also adopted white family so and I can't separate that life narrative from my professional work it just doesn't happen and neither could call it. so my point is why I use that as an example is it's just um, that's that's diversity at work like I'm there I'm in the room and then I'm allowed to exercise my point of view based on my perspective you don't have to agree with it but um, but that's that's how that works and what it can lead to to like you know um, world changing uh, um, innovation, it can, uh, opportunity access um, on that. So it's a long answer, but um, an, an important one for sure. Well, and you you brought up the Colin Kaepernick um, piece, and, and I wanted to chat with you just about a couple of in the past. Recent, most recent history, while you were there anyway, um, you guys developed some campaigns that were not strictly sports campaigns, if, if I'm saying that correctly. One was for LeBron James when he left the Cleveland Cal Cal Cavaliers, and the other one was for Colin when he 
He didn't have a team. So. It, well, you're you're. I think what the the cra uh, dream crazy campaign was actually the the uh, 30th anniversary of Just Do It, um, and um, it's a celebration of you know it's only a crazy dream until you do it, right? And it's showcasing just all types of athletes. And of course, Colin did the voiceover for that uh, that great film, and you know. Um, it's, it's no secret that um, the world, the U.S. has been quite, um, it's, it was polarizing and also uplifting depending on where you were at the, at the time. And America was very divided, um, you know, um, in 2018. Um, but it's still at its root is, is through um, uh, dreaming through sport yes. and feeling that, you know, Greatness is within you, and you just, you know, don't let anyone tell you any differently. And it's just, it's just, you just maybe need some motivation to kind of unleash that. And it's kind of Colin saying that, um, you know, um, believe in something even if it means sacrificing anything. Uh, as that last line, as a way of telling people, it's, it's just like, you know, um, it's, it's. Given the impact you may have, um, that sacrifice will, will, will be world changing on some levels. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, again, this is um, you have to have your your business, your brand house in order, as I like to say. You know, your, your brand house is your your belief. Why why do you exist? What's your what's your mission mission and vision? Like, where are you going? And how are you getting? There? And then your values. If you don't have that clear to all of your employees, whether you're a business of six people or six hundred or six thousand, it's really tough then to expand outside of your business to take on some of the most challenging issues in the world. So that's why I say you you you, you have to have a solid foundation for which you're going to speak on um, on that. Other, otherwise, it's it, it you know can be a bit bothered. So since I, we're going to wrap this up soon, so you guys can ask some questions, because I think we're reaching our time. But um, since you've left Nike, like, you started a consulting firm, um, and you're working with startups and smaller businesses. So you know, working for someone like Nike, where you have multi-million dollar budgets and lots of toys and celebrity, and, you know, all of this sort of stuff. How does how does a smaller company kind of wrap their arms around some of this? Yeah, well, it's it's great, and I have to remind myself that too, right? right. You, you can't ask them to do certain things. You know, they're not going to be rolling out a, a giant global campaign on that. But bo but boy, does the uh, does the um, traits of, of like courage uh, exist in, in huge helpings, right? Because you're 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 creating, and many of you have created your own businesses just in the so, like, you have this dream, and you're, you're going to realize it. And so, I just, I, I, I just love that, you know. And um, so, so part of what my role is in those situations, which is a little different than like an established brand, um, is it, it is trying to help with the fundamentals of brand building at an early stage, because um, the more you can think of yourself as as more than a product earlier in your maturity, I think the more opportunity you will see in the future, right? And it's hard when you're a startup because you're trying to perfect that product. Oftentimes you have investors, so you're trying to monetize that um, immediately because of the pressure with that. So what I'm trying to do is ensure that people understand that your product's an invitation to, to something amazing to a movement, to, to something bigger than ourselves, right? What is it? Like, what are you inviting people to be a part of for your, for your small or large brand? Um, you want to be able to answer that, right? It's not just a book. Like, it's, it's, it's a book that hopefully invites people to achieve their creative potential, right? Um, so I'm always asking that question over and over again of anything I'm, I'm involved with. Saying I even have my answers, but I, 
just my role is just to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the easy part. Just ask exactly. the question. Yeah. So I'm going to circle back just briefly um, to the personal. Since you were, since all of this has happened, you were recently um, reconnected with your birth families. Yeah, that's right. So, and I had, you know, as I wrote this, um, you know, my family, we had already kind of moved on because years ago we tried to find my birth parents and families and hit a brick wall, like exhausted all the avenues. Um, but of course, then there's all this, you know, I talked about the art and science, but there's been a lot of science in terms of using DNA to, to and machine learning and data analytics to connect people. <laughs> um, and it's really accelerated. And so, yeah, and, uh, one year ago, essentially around this time, um, I got a, I, I got a, from 23 to me from someone that said I was her uncle. She's like, I never knew I had an uncle, but when I looked closely, closer, um, like, how could I be an uncle if we're, if we're a 44% DNA match? That would be a bit. And then with some, because as we do some social media sleuthing, um, I, well, this is incredible. I find this person went to my high school. This person also got a graphic design degree, and then I it just it, it only took an hour to realize it's actually my sister, which meant her mom was my birth mom, and so that just explode like I, that exploded into two family trees, um, unbelievable generosity, like and open arms, right? Because um, you never know. I mean, it's I, I would say uh, actually it's the exception that re these, these reuniting adoptees with their birth, you know, actually, actually works. And, and so, yeah, within, um, I want to say, a month and a half, we flew to Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's always about Minnesota, right? <laughs> <laughs> you always keep going. And, you know, if you're, it's a hell of a thing when you are going to meet someone that gave birth to you for the first time as a 50-year-old. It's getting closer and closer. You're trying to be cool, <laughs> and you're going to show up to this park, and who's going to make the first move? What do you say? And is it going to be awkward and stuff? And you know what's amazing? She just came up running up to me and just gave me a huge hug. Just broke the ice. I was like, man, thank you. That's, like, I, didn't, I wasn't going to make that move as a gift. So, um, and and that's just led to this. Just uh, yeah, I, I just I tell my family it's a huge life from this. And, and then, the, and here's the crazy, and then we'll close close this part see if you have questions, but here's the, the like, unbelievable thing. So, a couple things. You know, one, art and design runs through both families. Like, like unbelievable. Like, within that day, the next day, they were sending me paintings that my grandmother did that were amazing. And then, but one of the biggest reveals is when in the mid-90s, um, I helped design a store at the Mall of America, a Nike store. So Mall of America is in Minnesota, right? It's, you don't need to go there. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I designed, you know, and I did design displays and this stuff. And so, um, you know, and my birth dad passed away two years ago, right? So his sister says that, did you know that, you know, Steve's, favorite store was the Nike store in Mall of America. Oh my like, gosh. What? It's like I designed wow. like a lot of the stuff in that store. They're like, yeah, we would when we'd shop there, we'd just drop Steve off, your dad, <laughs> and he would just hang out because he loved Michael Jordan and Nike and, and sports and stuff. And so this huge sports kind of deal on that side of the family just, wow. just kind of so my point is that, you know about maybe the last thing I'll say about it back to this creative, everyone's got creative capacity, but sometimes it just sits dormant. So yeah, I was born with some of it, but it may have just remained hidden had my parents not really like pulled it out, you know? And, and so I think that's just important with our kids, just in general, or each other, that you're always just trying to, back to empathy, recognizing what's in people um, and helping to 
more about that one um, because I think we can all use use that help. So, yeah. Do any of you have questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's some of your teaching? You've, been, yeah. you've had the opportunity to do some teaching. Um, how's that been? And what's your sagest advice you give to the kid, to the youth? To you? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I so I became the branding instructor at the University of Oregon's Graduate School of Business, which is the Lundquist College of Business in Portland, which is incredible again because it's you know it's you know, U of O, birthplace of Nike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, um, and again, I've never, obviously, I, you know, I've lectured and I've done short form class and stuff, but I'm not gonna lie, I was like, you want me to, you want me to hold three hours for 11 weeks in a row, like three hours. So I, I was, I was like, but um, that, that's, that first fall semester, being able to be in person, everybody's mass, but and be in front of the future of, in this case, school that offers a, a master's of science in sports product management, right? So these are future um, GMs that want to work in the sports world, right? Um, and um, so, yeah, you show up and it's game time. It's like, what do you got? Me. I'm asking myself, you know, the, the self-talk. It starts really negative. Right? What do you, you know, you are an imposter. You know? <laughs> But then, uh, by the end of that session, um, like, it, it was just unbelievable how much, um, back, back to, I guess this is, was the uh, lesson for me, is you give people the prompt, um, and the, you set the ball up on the tee, and they'll take that opportunity. And so the sharing and dialogues and conversations, we actually could have even used more time in that, that, that first hour. But, um, you know, and a lot of the stuff I share with them is in the books in terms of what, what are the, what are the principles of not only building a strong brand, a product, but also being a good teammate, right? Um, and I always say, like, you, you really need equal parts um, self-confidence and self-awareness. And that, that, by the third class, I'm like, Okay, we're gonna create a, a, a you're gonna articulate your product's brand personality. You're gonna write down the characteristics that you want to associate with your product, with your product. So, but you I want you to do that for yourself as well. Because the way you show up, you have some control of that. And when you're not in the room, how do you want to be talked about as a teammate? And um, because I've managed small teams, huge teams, lots of different types. You know, in the creative world, you've got lots of personalities, right? And I'd often hear from people, it's like, well, that person is so um, creative, but they're really difficult. Or that person is just great. Yeah, and, it, and it's like, well, you have control over that. And so that's one of the things. It's like, it's like write down the three, three traits that you'd like to be known for, and then lean into those and show up that way. Um, and more than likely, over time, that, that act, just like building a brand and a brand impression in people's minds, do that as, because here's the thing, we all work for companies, but we never spend enough time on ourselves. We're spending so much time on how we want people to react and engage and feel about this company that we have. And oftentimes, you suffer in the process. You know, there's, there's, there's a great quote by, Weiner, uh, who was the creator of the show Mad Men, and he said, you know, all of us on the team were uh, run ragged but creatively satisfied. And I'm like, I don't think that we can do that today. Like, you want to be satisfied, but but um, you want it to be uh, a multiplying environment, like that feels healthy physically, mentally, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So I just think we're in a different time. And so, but anyways, um, that that that's just just one that had really nothing to do with the syllabus. But I but because I've seen what happens when people don't own it, um, and thankfully people in the service industry, where you're, you're person to person, you have to exhibit 
a certain quality, so otherwise people will go somewhere else. You know, so. Yeah, that's so true. If you were to go back to the beginning, uh, and knowing what you know now, if you were to pick another company, another brand to go with, do you have an idea of what that might be? Yeah, I mean, so again, I, I'll, I'll say this, we didn't have much, but somehow my dad, he, he got the first Apple II console. He couldn't afford the monitor, but got a brand new Apple II computer brought it home, we hooked it up to the black and white TV that you know, literally used the wires to toggle, <laughs> toggle it back to a computer TV. But, but, um, but Apple, um, you know, with their Think Different campaign, um, their famous um, uh, campaign inspired by 1984, you know, um, they have the, all this amazing history of clearly painting a vision of what's possible and clearly inviting people that maybe think a bit, you know, unconventionally or outsiders. And so that that's always been a brand that I had a, an affinity for. Um, and quite frankly kind of saved me when I got to Nike for an internship because that was the year they got their Macs. And I had been using them in college so I became quite fluent and was able to show up and at, at the very least Make myself like, you know, yeah, I could turn it off. Um, I knew, knew how to do that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you, you have to find, like, what's your, yeah, what are your, I always say this, it's like, you know, be a T shaped player, you know, where you're, um, you're deeply fluent in something, and people can, people can see that and feel that, you know, the deep expertise in something, but you also have confidence here across because today, um, we live in this connected world, and people demand that they live in a seamless experience with no friction or inconvenience, right? And so being a T-shaped player, player allows you to play a role within an institution or a business um, in, in a pretty effective way because, you, again, you, you have an um, a affinity to, to, to learn what others are relates to what you were doing. Anyway, we're not teaching today, but it's Apple. <laughs> so did you, did you have an opportunity to meet your, do you know your counterpart over there? Do you have a good relationship with the Apple? Over the years, yeah. I mean, well, and, and I, you know, um, just the, the, the high standard of excellence. So their version of when I was head of um, creative for, for Nike, like storytelling and experiences, um, we would do um, these uh, team the teams with their team, but it, you know it's interesting that when they would come to um, Nike, you know we would just show them everything we were doing, and we would go down there and it's like, well wait a minute, how come everything is behind these giant pieces of white film <laughs> core? Um, my counterpart, I was like, well, like, you know, are, are we, you know, um, and yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's it's I think. Um, Know, it's a testament to how seriously they, they obviously take their foundation. But you know, I, I'll say this: maybe this is the one last kind of lesson I learned that I convey to people is it's like the, you hold the smallest detail to the highest standard, and you shall be successful. Right? Steve Jobs cared so much about the letter spacing on an ad. There's too much space between a period and the letter T. Right, that's the, the founder. So this idea of finishing strong, obsessing the last 10% of a project, right? And, and not being the team that just says, you know what, this is good enough, let's just go to lunch. Because you do see that a lot, right? You know when you see it, when something just, people said, I think we're good. <laughs> you know, so brand, a brand like Apple, it's like, in their entire culture, that just wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> and you feel it, right? And and you know you appreciate that they took the time to um, uh, take really complex directions on how to set up your phone and just consolidate it and simplify it 
into free statements. Like, wow, thank you. Right? But um, a lot of people wouldn't take the time or have the endurance um, to do that. Thank you all for being here.